Hi everyone, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Rebecca, otherwise known as Hypnit Hooray Online, and this is podcast episode number four. So I have a few finished objects, including this one here, <laughs> uh, and some progress on the whips that I shared in my last episode. Uh, no plans at the moment, I'll get into that later, and some acquisitions. So let's just get started with my first finished object. It is this right here. I, don't, I have no idea how this angle is going to look, <laughs> but this is my April cardigan. And I think I'll just, let me just take it off so I can um, share it with you. This is my April cardigan. Uh, here's the front and then the back. So this was a very long uh, and languishing whip that I had. Um, I think I had said I casted it on earlier this year in February, but that actually wasn't true. That was when I had cast on the zipper sweater light with this yarn combination. I didn't like how it was working out. And so then I cast this on in May. So it's been a whip uh, for about, how long is that since May? Is it seven months? <laughs> I don't know why I didn't know that off the top of my head. But um, it's been a whip for seven months. Um, and the reason why is because I took a break from knitting it uh, in the summertime just because I didn't really want to be knitting with wool and mohair uh, when it was so warm. So I took a bit of a break. And then when I picked it back up in the fall, I made quite a few modifications uh, to, to this, uh, the cardigan. So maybe I'll just get into, I, I'm trying to create a bit more structure around my finished objects besides saying that I really like all of them <laughs> because I feel like maybe it's a little implied that I will like all of them. I want to give a bit more detail onto the, the yarn, the process, modifications, how I feel overall. So I'm going to try and stick to that structure. So let's start off with the yarn. So the yarn that I used is um, Lang Jowl Superwash yarn. This is 75% wool and 25% polyamide. It's meant to be a sock yarn. And I used the shade Goldfields. And then I held it with um, Knitting for Olive Soft Silk Mohair in the shade Ochre. Uh, in terms of the pricing of this yarn, I purchased them both a few years ago. Um, this one I purchased from uh, La Babanus in Montreal, and at the time it was uh, $10 a skein. Uh, right now, I searched it up at my local yarn store, Unit, and it's uh, $11 now, Canadian. And then this yarn here I purchased a few years ago from Unit. At the time, the um, mohair was $14, but they constantly run um, sales. So I got it for a little bit less than $14, but now the price is $16. Uh, so I just have my laptop here because I want to give a bit more of a recap into the total meterage and, and the pricing of everything. So I used for this uh, cardigan around a thousand meters. So that's around five balls of uh, the jowl and then um, just over five balls of the knitting for all of soft silk mohair. So in total, uh, the project cost around $120 to, to knit, but I do have quite a bit of leftovers. Um, so I have enough for another project, I would say like maybe like a beanie or some sort of small accessory. So in terms of the Lang Jowl, this was my first time using this yarn. I really enjoyed it. It's pretty soft, um, but I think very durable because of the polyamide. It's what I imagine, uh, what is that yarn called? Uh, Filcolana Arweta. I know that's a very popular yarn you can get, um, maybe readily available more in the um, EU or in the UK, uh, but it's really hard to find here. There's only one shop that I know of in the general area that I live that carries it. Um, I haven't had a chance to try it yet. I really want to, but I think this would be somewhat comparable to that when I was looking at the composition. So because of the enjoyable experience I had knitting with this yarn, it definitely makes me want to try that one in the future. But this uh, yarn combination together, I would 10 out of 10 recommend. I think it's moderately priced for the type of quality you're getting out of the, the yarn. Um, you could substitute the mohair for something like um, drops or knit picks aloft. Uh, but the colors just go really well together because knitting for all of soft silk mohair just has such a great uh, color variety. So yeah, I would totally recommend this yarn combination. I can't say enough good things about it. And I would use this combination in a heartbeat again. 
So in terms of the sizing and the fit of this cardigan, so I knit this with uh, 3.5 millimeter needles. The pattern uses four millimeter needles, but to achieve gauge and just because I like the finished fabric of a smaller needle, I use 3.5 millimeter needles. And to account for that, I also knit a size medium. So normally with petite knit patterns, I'm an extra small, but I went up two um, sizes for that smaller um, needle gauge, but also because I wanted a bit of a looser fit. So the pattern recommends six to eight centimeters of positive ease, so more of a fitted uh, cardigan. I wanted a little bit more, so um, mine ended up being around, I would say like 10 to 12 centimeters of positive ease. So um, just under double the amount of positive ease that's recommended, and I really like the fit. I'm planning to wear this over like jeans or, or trousers, so I wanted I don't know, I just like the fit of that and I'm glad I, I, I made that decision at the beginning. So yeah, a bit more positive ease on, on this one. This uh, is a cardigan that's constructed from the top down with a saddle shoulder technique. So I kind of went into that in my last podcast. You can see here, this is the saddle shoulder. So it's constructed, I think it's referred to as a contiguous saddle shoulder construction because you're working the saddle shoulder piece at the same time as you're working uh, the front, the back, and the sleeve increases. I've done a saddle shoulder uh, before where I don't think that was contiguous. You knit the saddle piece and then you pick up stitches on either side. This is knit all in one, so uh, super seamless and uh, just a really cool construction. So this is the saddle shoulder. It's a little bit more narrow, so while you're knitting this, you cast on at the back and then you're knitting the saddle shoulder piece at the same time as the back and the front and the sleeves. And you're doing different rates of increases uh, to achieve that. Um, I really like the fit of saddle shoulders. I'm on a journey to experiment with different types. Uh, and so far I'm really liking this. I'm really intrigued by, I think it's called the Eros sweater by Petit Knit as well that has the same construction technique, but in a sweater pattern, I, I enjoy the fit. So I would try to knit that in the future. Um, and then, so it's knit top down, as I mentioned, and then once you uh, reach the point where you separate for the sleeves and the body, then you're knitting the body flat and then the sleeves in the round. Uh, and then maybe I can get into the modifications that I made because at that point I started going a little bit rogue from, from the pattern. So, uh, I extended the body by five centimeters um, before working the ribbing, just because I wanted a slightly longer fit. I think it's a good length on me. I kind of, now that I have a lot of yarn left over at the end, I kind of wish I extended it even longer so it would hit like mid thigh. I think that would have been nice, um, but I'm not going back to, to do that at that point. Uh, but yeah, I, I knit the body five centimeters longer. I also did the one by one ribbing in a slightly different way as well. I followed the uh, tutorial by 10 rows a day. I'm gonna link it down below because um, they explain it in a much better and concise way than, than I ever could. Um, but essentially you are um, slipping certain stitches and then knitting or purling certain stitches and you get this elongated um, column of knit rows and I just think it looks very uh, clean, very neat and just just very even, very uniform. So I really like that technique. I'm going to definitely use it in the future. The tutorial also shows how to do this technique flat and in the round. They're pretty similar but there's some variations in it so just check out the tutorial to, to see. But because I did it flat um, first for the, the body, it would have looked a little bit different if I did the sleeves just regular one by one rib because I don't have that problem with tension. But because the knit stitches are elongated, it just would have looked kind of different. So I did the same for the body and the sleeves. The sleeves in this cardigan are a little bit more fitted um, and I, I really like that. So I just followed the instructions for the pattern, the rate of decreases to do to get this tapered sleeve. The only thing is I knit the um, sleeve ribbing eight centimeters instead of six centimeters as mentioned in the pattern. Uh, and then the other big modification that I made is I did a double knit button band. So the um, 
button band in the April cardigan is a one by one rib um, that's done like horizontally. So you pick up stitches all the way around and then you're knitting one by one rib while working buttonholes on one side. And then you cast off in um, tubular or Italian bind off. And um, I just really wanted to do a double knit button band. I just really like the look. I think it's really clean. It's really refined. It's definitely a labor of love. It takes a lot of time, but I just think it's, it's so worth it. And even um, after doing the button band like four times, <laughs> I still don't regret doing it. And I'm so happy with how it turned out. So um, I knit the button band with um, 2.5 millimeter needles. So I picked up in every uh, stitch and then I cast on stitches to do the button band. But I do want to mention this, I think segment is not going to make a lot of sense if you haven't done a double knit button band before, but I think it's really important. And I really <laughs> want to mention it because I was um, doing the button band and it didn't work the first time because I didn't do this. So I followed three different tutorials to do this double knit button band. Two of them were by Kimmy Molcomb for Petite Knit. And then the other one was by Florence Miller of Handmade, Handmade by Florence. So for the button band cast on, I followed the tutorial for the champagne cardigan. Um, they just show on the tutorial how to do a, I think it's like a tubular or Italian cast on to get a nice seamless, um, edge for the one end of your button band and then the tutorial also has um, a guide of how to place your buttonholes and also the buttons on the other side of the the cardigan there's just a little bit of a technique to get them uh, even spacing apart from each other so i followed that tutorial but then for the buttonholes i followed the uh, also a tutorial by kimmy Molcom, but it was a tutorial for how to knit these buttonholes here uh, without breaking the yarn. So in the champagne uh, cardigan tutorial, they show how to knit the buttonholes, uh, but you have to break the yarn uh, at each buttonhole two times. But there is a recent uh, tutorial that came out a few months ago, I think for the Jenny Jacket V-neck cardigan for how to work these buttonholes without breaking the yarn. I would totally recommend uh, that tutorial. It was, it was great. <laughs> and I think, uh, the, the buttonholes turned out really nice. Um, but for that tutorial, I, I don't have the pattern, so I don't know the exact stitch count, but you, in order to work these buttonholes without breaking the yarn, it needs to be an even number of stitches. The champagne cardigan tutorial, you pick up 15 stitches, but that didn't work for these buttonholes. So I picked up 16 stitches, um, uh, for the, the buttonhole. And then for the cast off, once I reached the end, um, the side with the, the buttons, I followed um, Handmade by Florence's double knit button band tutorial because she shows how to cast off the stitches. My final thoughts on this cardigan is I would totally knit another one. I think it's quite rare that I knit two things nowadays just because there's so many patterns out there that I want to knit. But I would totally knit this um, cardigan again in the future. I'm really happy with the fit, the amount of ease. I would almost knit it in the exact same way, just in another color. Um, I really like the yarn combination. I would definitely recommend that. And um, check out the double knit button band tutorials online on YouTube in order to uh, get this technique because those were also really great and easy to follow along too. My next uh, few finished objects I don't have on me anymore because I already gifted them. So I'll just insert like a photo right here and just talk about them quickly because a few of them I've already mentioned in my last podcast. So I knit a set of four ornaments for my boyfriend's parents. We went with them to go pick out a tree last week. Uh, and I just thought they're, they're both extremely knit worthy and I wanted to make them a little set of ornaments. They really love um, like woodland animals and birds. So I wanted to center the, the theme of the ornaments around that. So I knit the Songbird, which is by Sarah Elizabeth Kellner. Uh, I knit the Holly Bow by Petite Knit. I knit the Little Cottage by Agatutak and the Christmas Toadstool by Marin Curley. So I already knit the, or I already showed on my podcast, the Little Cottage and the Christmas Toadstool. So maybe I'll go into the Holly Bow and the Songbird quickly right now. So the Holly Bow is a, um, 
Christmas decoration pattern that Petite Knit came out with this year. It's a free pattern that you can download from Ravelry or from their website. And you're knitting two leaves flat on, I believe it's 3.5 millimeter needles. Um, and it just looks really elegant. I really like the way that it looks and, and they're very quick to work up. I think I knit both uh, leaves in under an hour. Uh, you do have to block them though in order for them to sit flat. Uh, and in the pattern sample photos, Petite Knit uh, attaches a ribbon, I think a ribbon with wire in it on top. I didn't want to do that, A, because I didn't have a ribbon with wire. And also I just wanted something that had a little bit more of a, um, I guess, subtle, subtle look to it. So what I did is I cast on four stitches on double pointed needles, also on 3.5 millimeter needles, and I knit a 20 centimeter I-cord, and then I folded that into the shape of a bow, and then I attached it to the two leaves. I used the same combination as what I did for the um, bottom part of the little cottage, so it kind of all tied in together. Uh, and for the songbird, this was the first time that I worked in Tarsha. So like I've been saying with all of the ornament patterns that I've been knitting, I really like knitting ornaments because it's a way to experiment with different techniques that you've never done before in a less intimidating uh, project. So with this one, you're working um, to color in Tarsha. And like I said, I had never done that before. So I was very intimidated. I just searched up some tutorials on YouTube for how to do it. And I don't know why I was intimidated for so long because it's actually, it's really not that bad. Um, tension was a little bit tight at the beginning uh, when I was working it. So I adjusted for that, but really, I don't know why I was so intimidated. If you're intimidated by intarsia, please give it a try because I really like the, the look of it. I think it could maybe get a little bit um, overwhelming when you're working more than one color, but it was a pretty easy technique and one that I'm definitely going to try in the future. The songbird is knit in four separate pieces and then you seam them together. So the uh, front part of the bird, the back side, and then the two wings. So it's a little bit more fiddly to work up. It was definitely the most time consuming out of all of them that I knit, but that one is definitely my favorite out of all four that I knit. It is just, I think it's just such a sweet little bird. And my uh, boyfriend's mom really loves bird watching. So I'm really happy that I was able to make that uh, pattern for her. And now onto my whips. I have four whips here. I have shared three of them before, but I've made progress on them. So the first one is, the Frankie Ganser, which is a pattern in uh, Sanis Garn's 2022 fall pattern booklet. There's two different versions of the Frankie Ganser in the booklet. I'm knitting the thinner gauge version on 3.5 millimeter needles. So you've already seen this before, but it might look a little bit different because I blocked it. Uh, so this pattern I'm knitting with Camaro's Yaku, which is a 100% uh, merino yarn in the shade Lispla. Oh, hopefully I'm saying that right. And I purchased this from the Knitting Loft. Um, I already mentioned I didn't make a ton of progress on uh, this sweater so far. I just need a little bit more of the body, but I feel like in my last podcast, I didn't really go too much into the details of how I knit this. So I kind of want to mention a few other things. Uh, so the um, at the time of my last podcast, I had already had the, um, neckline of the sweater. But what I didn't mention is I use a stretchy bind off for the ends. Whenever I see a tighter neckline, like in this pattern, a lot of the project photos, the neckline was quite tight. I always like to use a stretchy bind off. I think maybe I have like a large head, <laughs> but I always kind of struggle with very tight necklines. Uh, sometimes I've knit projects in the past and then I knit the entire neckline and then I can't get it over my head. So now whenever I see that, I just do a stretchy bind off. I followed one from uh, Ozetta. This is a technique that she includes in a lot of her patterns where there's a double folded collar. I don't know if I can mention how to do it because when I was looking on YouTube and through a Google search, I didn't see this technique specified. So it might be part of the paid pattern, but if you have one of those Ozetta patterns, um, I really recommend that technique. So I did that for this neckline and it and it creates like a very stretchy neckline and I'm able to fit it over my head, no problem. So um, that's what I did for the neckline. 
but uh, when I tried on the sweater, because I, I had mentioned in my Instagram post that the neckline was looking very small, and just the whole shape of the body, it was just fitting very narrow. So I was like, you know what? This pattern is going to feature a lot of twisted rib once I get to the hems of the body and the sleeves. So I need to make sure that I'm going to enjoy the fit and how the sweater looks right now at this moment before I knit all of that twisted rib. So what I did is I took it off uh, the needles and then I did a mid project block. I hadn't really done this in the past, but I'm learning that this is something that I'm definitely going to try and do in the future because as as we all know blocking is really magical and it really transforms how a project or how a, a piece fits at the end so i did that i did a mid-project block and when i was putting it on the blocking mats i really stretched out the neckline quite significantly and i placed blocking pins along the shoulders at the top so it could um, block out to be quite wide because it was sitting very narrow on my shoulders I'll put a photo here. I have a photo that I took. It's not the best lighting, but it was just showing that it kind of looks like uh, when you knit a sweater without short rows. It just had a lot of bunching at the front and it was sitting very tight at the back. Uh, so that was the before. And then I'll show a photo after right now and just show how much it really transformed and it's a very comfortable fit now. Uh, the body is a little bit wider than what I was thinking it was going to be. Um, I'm knitting a size medium because I size down to 3.5 millimeter needles. So I'm knitting the um, size medium in the pattern to account for that. It's, it's a little bit wider than what I was expecting. Um, just because when I was knitting the body in the round, it, I was knitting them on smaller uh, circular needles. I think I had, I'd use my 24 inch cable. So I wasn't seeing how wide it actually became. But actually, I think that's going to work really well for the split hem and the twisted rib. I think a little bit more of an oversized fit uh, for me is going to be really nice. So I'm glad that that actually was a unintended accident. <laughs> so yeah, really happy with this. Um, didn't make a lot of progress, but I did want to talk about the, the blocking um, and just how much it, it just really transformed this sweater. My next whip is my sweater number 14 v-neck by My Favorite Things Knitwear. This has been a bit of a languishing whip or one that I just haven't really touched. I don't think I featured it on my last podcast and then when I had mentioned it in my second knitting podcast, uh, I hadn't made any progress. So actually I hadn't really touched this since September. Um, but that was because I was knitting um, another chunky uh, or heavier gauge sweater, the Aspen sweater. It was a test knit for Ulan Knitwear. Uh, and then I just wanted to take a break from larger gauge projects because A, I find that um, when I knit with anything larger than like a 5.5 millimeter needle, it tends to hurt my hands. I think the weight of the, the fabric. So I don't like to have too many projects at once on larger gauge needles and then b i just like the satisfaction of knitting something very quickly on a larger gauge as well so i wanted to space them out to get that uh progress or i i don't know if that's making sense but i just wanted to spread them out so i could see the progress quicker on multiple projects i guess is what i'm trying to say um so this sweater was on ice for a little bit but now i picked it up again and i've worked the two front panels so this sweater I'm knitting with uh, Lion Brand Wool Ease, which is an acrylic wool blend. I believe it's, actually I have the package here. Sorry, I just had to pull one with the label so it's easier to see. Uh, so this is a 80% acrylic, 20% wool blend. It's a very affordable yarn. I enjoy working with it. Uh, it's maybe not my favorite yarn, but I, I do like it. So I'm using that uh, in the shade Linen. It's like just like an off-white kind of cream color. And then I'm holding it together with Drops Kid Silk in the shade Beige. Uh, and then when I hold these two together, I think I had mentioned it in my fir first podcast, when I hold an acrylic wool blend with mohair, I do really like how that finished fabric looks. Uh, and it just really elevates the wool ease by holding um, a strand of mohair with it. So the pattern uh, recommends, or the pattern calls for three strands of mohair, so a uh, lace weight yarn. 
This is a worsted weight yarn held together with a lace weight yarn. So it's a little bit more of a substantial kind of squishier fabric. Um, but I, I wanted that because I wanted this sweater to be like a cozy throw on over anything sweater. I wear my October sweater, which is a very comfortable oversized sweater by Petite Knit. I wear that all the time, especially when I'm working from home, I just throw it over anything. And so I just wanted that for this sweater. Um, so having it at a bit of like a squishier, uh, warmer fabric, I'm, I'm very happy with that. So um, I, as I mentioned, I worked the front two panels um, the last few weeks and I don't have a lot of modifications that I was making to the pattern. So you first knit the back piece with short rows and then you're working flat back and forth and then you put those stitches on hold and then you pick up stitches along that to knit the front panels and then you're working uh, increases to shape that v-neck at the front. So I'm following the stitch counts in this pattern but I wanted it to fit in between a size one and a size two. So I really like the amount of ease in the size two because I wanted this to be a comfy throw over sweater that I could wear kind of over, over anything as a layering piece. Um, so I wanted the ease of a size two but I didn't want the drop shoulder to be too low um, on, on my shoulder because I find that that can just be a little bit of an uncomfortable fit for me. So what I did is for the back panel, I cast on the amount of stitches for a size one, and then I knit the back panel following the size one instructions. I knit the front pieces like the size one instructions until I got to the bottom where I started working some increases. I don't know if you'll be able to tell this angle. For the last 12 rows of the back panel, I did an increase on either side of the back panel every four, fourth row, a total of three times. So I increased um, six times, or I increased by six stitches at the bottom. So the back panel had six additional stitches by the time I reached the end. And then for the front, I did the same thing. I followed the um, stitch counts and the repeats for the front pieces, but the last eight rows, I increased every fourth round and I did that two times. So there were two additional stitches on this side, two additional stitches on this side, and then at the front in total, there's gonna be an additional four stitches. And so I did those increases so the body can be a little bit larger, uh, but not have that excess bulk that would happen if I had cast those on at the beginning for the drop shoulder. But for this pattern, if you do want to do that, I would just um, caution that it has to line up with the two by two rib pattern. So um, I won't mention the stitch counts, I guess, because it's part of the pattern, but essentially if you're doing a split hem at the bottom of the body, you need um, the front and the back pieces to be a even number, a total even number and it needs to be divisible by four because you want the two edges of the split hem to be bordered by two knit stitches at the end to get that split hem. So yeah, I would just be careful about that. Um, if you are going to be doing increases like this, just be aware of that because if you aren't and then you reach that end when you're about to do st um, the split hem, you might end up having like a mismatch of stitch counts. I hope that that wasn't too technical to mention, <laughs> just like the April Kurtigan uh, double knit button band tutorial uh, explanation that I was trying to give. But I just think it's like useful advice, at least when I'm watching knitting podcasts, when if I wanted to knit that project in the future, uh, to know these things, to not have to frog again in the future, because that was something I had to frog when I was doing this sweater. My next whip is my freehand Candyland wrap, and I've made quite a bit of progress on it. I don't know if it's gonna fit in the whole frame. <laughs> uh, but this is the, the wrap progress so far. So I've done um, one color block, the second color block, and now I'm on my third of five color blocks. Um, and I'm really enjoying how this is working up. It was more of like a portable project that I would bring uh, when I was commuting, but now it's getting a little bit large. So I might have to make this now an at-home knitting project. Uh, but 
This is a just a pretty simple stockinette wrap that I've been doing. I'm knitting it on 3.5 millimeter needles and I cast on 156 stitches and I'm just working it in the round. Uh, where it becomes fun is when I do these color changes. Uh, but maybe I'll just talk about the yarn quickly first because I had mentioned in my last knitting podcast that I was a little bit disappointed with the quality of the yarn. So the yarn that I'm using is the Hobby Friends Extra Fine Merino yarn. Again, I have the yarn here in the label to show you. Um, so this is the yarn here. It's 100% uh, merino wool yarn and it's 165 meters for every 50 grams. So about a um, heavy fingering, maybe a light sport weight yarn. And when I had started with the green, which was the last time I had chatted about this wrap, I had used the first skein and there were three separate knots that was in that skein. Uh, and so I was just a little bit disappointed in the quality of it, but I've since knit the second, third and fourth skeins uh, for the rest of the wrap. And I actually didn't have any uh, knots or joins in, the, in those ones. So uh, I was really pleased with that. But then when I reached this color here, the um, shade tomato, this yarn has had three joins in it already. And I've only knit that much of the wrap in that color. So I still have this much yarn and I already encountered three different joins. So I would say my opinions about this yarn is mixed. <laughs> I really like the yarn selection. There's a ton of different colors that you can choose from. The yarn is super, it's very soft, um, and it. I really like the finished fabric. I think if you pair this with mohair, it would just be a super soft um, and lofty type of finished fabric. I really like that, but I think the uh, quality control is a bit mixed. Uh, certain skeins are going to be nice. Um, but you're just, if you order like maybe a sweater's quantity or quite a few of these balls, just be prepared that maybe some of them are going to have quite a few joins. Not all of them, but so far I've used five different skeins and two of them have had knots in them. So I would still recommend the yarn. I really like it, but just be aware that if you really don't like having knots in, in the ball, then this yarn may, may have it if you order it. But back to the process of this wrap. So I went with option one, which is the um, one by one color work with the main color and the contrast color, which is the cream color in this case. So uh, this color here. So what I did was I measured on my yarn scale how much yarn was consumed by each row. And I found that each row of this wrap used around one gram of yarn. Uh, you don't have to do this. I just wanted to be more exact so I could make sure that I, I had enough yarn at the end to do the color work change and have a little bit at the end because I'm planning to do a bit of a scrappy project with the leftovers. So I wanted to have a little bit left at the end. So yes, I uh, noticed that there was, you used one gram of yarn for every row. So I knit until I had seven grams of yarn left in that main color. So in this case, it would have been the chartreuse green. Uh, and then I brought in the cream color for the one by one color work. So I did seven rounds of one by one color work um, with that first main color. And then I switched to do seven rounds of one by one color work with the second uh, main color with the white. And I didn't alternate or switch when that color work was. So it's just one long row of, um, or one long column of cream. I really like the way it looks. This one I think is fantastic. I'm so happy with how this one turned out. This one I'm like, eh, about. <laughs> I don't love this color combination that much, but the next color I'm planning to bring into the wrap is the pink. So I'm, I think that that color work transition is gonna look nice. This one is just all right, but it's okay. <laughs> um, I still like the overall effect. Um, what I did for the color work is, I already had mentioned um, that I did, it's 14 rounds of, of this one by one color work and I sized up to four millimeter needles to account for the gauge. Cause I, this is my first time working color work but I know that your gauge can um, change when you're working with stranded color work because the strands on the inside or I guess the floats, I guess you could call them um, affect the tension of your yarn because it's not as um, flexible or stretchy at the end. 
So I sized up um, half a needle size to four millimeters to kind of account for that. And I think it does, like it still cinches in a bit, but someone um, on my Instagram told me that the blocking is really gonna help fix that. Um, so looking forward to the blocking transformation for this piece. And what I also am learning about color work is color dominance. So in color work, I think it's like more of a subtle detail. You, It's kind of one of those things where if you see it, you can't unsee it. Or if you're the knitter, you won't be able to unsee it <laughs> once you knit it. So um, with two color, color work, uh, one color is going to be your dominant color, which is the color that pops more in the knitted fabric. So um, I knit color work two-handed. I can knit English style and continental style. So um, when I'm doing the 14 rounds of color work, I have one color on my left hand and then one color on my right hand. And the color that's held, if you're doing two color color work, the color on, that you hold on your left hand is the dominant color. It's gonna be the color that pops more. So I actually did the first color work section twice. I did it the first time and I held, I thought I would like the look of the white popping a little bit more. So I held the white or the cream color in my left hand and then the green on the on my right hand. And I just, there was something about it that I had some doubts about. I was like, actually, I don't really like the look of that. Uh, and so I was like, you know what? This is gonna be a very big project. Let me try and switch the colors uh, and see what it looks like with the um, main color, so the green being that dominant color. So about halfway, I switched to the green being the dominant color, and I was like, yeah, I, I like that better. <laughs> and so I frogged it till I got to the beginning of the color work section, and I did that. So when I was working the color work, uh, the cream is... Um, doesn't pop as much. I feel like it's kind of hard to tell. I wish I took like a comparison photo to show what it looked like, but if you just search it up online, color dominance, there's a lot of different uh, images that show uh, what a difference it can make. So I've just been repeating that for the color work changes. So now I'm on to my red panel. And then when I get to the next color work piece, which is the uh, red and then the pink transition, it'll be the same thing. Um, the main color will be the dominant color in the color work. So yeah, I'm hoping to maybe finish this sometime in January, we'll see. I was getting a lot of progress on it uh, before, but now it's been kind of been put on hold for a little bit, but I'll pick it up again. Um, and maybe around the holidays, closer to the holidays when we have some more time off of work. So making some steady progress on, on this one. And my last whip that I wanna just mention briefly, cause I don't have a lot of progress on it, it is my Afton's Baby Bumblebee, which is a pattern that I'm knitting for my scrap ornament make-along over on Instagram. I'm going to link the post down below uh, that goes over the details of the make-along that I'm hosting, so check it out if you're interested. Um, this is a pattern by Afton Streak. It's their Baby, baby Bumblebee pattern. I believe it's like a mobile or rattle um, pattern, but I'm going to be knitting it as an ornament because it's the perfect size. Um, and this is one of the six patterns that's on discount right now. Um, Afton Streak or Enya of Afton Streak provided a 40% off discount for the following six patterns. Again, I'll put a photo here of the six patterns on her website that you can use throughout the course of the make along. So until December 25th, and I'm knitting the first pattern that I plan to make uh, from her, which is the Baby Bumblebee. There's not really much to say about this pattern. It's knit um, in the round on, I'm knitting the smaller size in the pattern, so it's on three millimeter needles. Uh, and there's just two different colors. It's kind of a tangled mess right now, but it's two different colors for the body of the bumblebee. And then you knit the wings um, in a light cream color. So I think I'm gonna do actually a strand of mohair to make them kind of look translucent like like wings. Uh, so you attach those on at the end. Uh, I really like the way that the pattern is written and formatted. It's very uh, clear to follow along. My only feedback is the pattern doesn't include numbered rows. So it's kind of hard to keep track of a little bit. I use a knitting app for patterns. Um, I use Knit Companion, which allows you to have highlighted rows that you can move around. So it's easier to keep track of the rows. Um, but if you were to print out the pattern or have a physical copy, it might be a little bit hard to keep track because you're 
doing different things um, in different rows. And when they're not numbered, it can be a little bit hard to remember, especially working with black yarn uh, where it's kind of hard to see your stitches. So that's my only feedback for the pattern. But other than that, it's been really enjoyable and I'm happy to have this ornament uh, under the tree. After this one, I'm going to knit one more uh, ornament for my tree. It's also gonna be an Afton Street pattern. It's the hot air balloon number one. I usually have a plan section in my knitting podcast, but I'm actually going to skip over that for this one. I recently released my winter knitting plants with stash yarn video, um, and that is going over all of my plants for the winter. So I thought that that could be a good supplement to this section of the podcast. And I'm really not going to be casting on, or I'm going to really try not to cast on anything until the end of the year to try and finish some of the whips that I have on the needles. The only thing is, is what I just mentioned is the hot air balloon number one. I want to make that so I can put it on my tree before Christmas, but I really want to focus on finishing some of my whips at the moment. So a very short plans section in this podcast, but I do have some acquisitions to share. So I made an order through Knitpicks um, as part of their the big sale. So I I really enjoy Knit Picks yarn. I think that they're relatively affordable and very high quality. Everything, I've used a decent amount of yarn um, lines from them and they've all been, I've been super impressed. They've all been great quality, um, but I usually wait until they have their big sale, which they hold twice a year. So once in the spring, once in the fall. Uh, I know I've been saying that I've been trying to limit the amount of yarn, but uh, I just, these are things that I've been wanting to try for a while and maybe I don't even need to justify it to, <laughs> to you or to myself, uh, but I did place a, an order and I wanted to share. So these were yarns that I wanted to try out for quite a bit of time and yarns that I've really enjoyed working with. Um, so yeah, they have their um, sale twice a year and they have a pretty good discount on the yarn. So I think I got this I don't know how many days they had it, but they were having a two, three, and four sale, which is yarns that are $2, $3, and $4. And then they also emailed me a 20% off discount code that applied. So uh, during the big sale through Knitpicks, you can also stack discounts. Um, so I would say also like take advantage of, of that as well. So I bought a few things, um, mainly uh it looks like a lot, but it is like sweaters quantity. So that's why there's so many balls of, of yarn. So I'll start off with maybe going into the two yarns that I got and I'll go into the colors and the pricing after. So this is Knit Picks Aloft, which is a lace weight mohair. It is my favorite mohair to work with. So I always wait until the um, semi-annual sale that Knit Picks has before I stock up on it. It's 72% super kid mohair, 28% silk, and there's a decent amount of meterage or yardage in each skein. So it's 260 yards, which I think is like 240-ish meters for every 25 grams. So a little bit more uh, meterage that you get for every skein. And I really like this mohair. It's my favorite to work with. The only thing is I wish it had a bigger color range. It's a little bit limited, um, but out of all of them, I just, I totally think it's worth it. I really like the, the mohair. So if there's colors that you like, definitely recommend. It's pretty comparable to the Sagar silk mohair, which I had a chance to work with earlier this fall in terms of the amount of fluff that's on, on the, the mohair. I find it's like a little bit fluffier than uh, knitting for all of soft silk mohair, similar to the Sagar. Um, so yeah, I really like this, this uh, mohair, totally recommend. And then the other yarn that I've been wanting to try for quite a while is Knit Picks Palette, which is um, I think 100, yeah, 100% Peruvian Highland wool, and it's a um, fingering weight yarn. So it's 231 yards for every 50 grams, which I think is like 212 meters, if I'm doing the calculations correctly, um, for every 50 grams. This is a pretty popular uh, yarn line that Knit Picks carries, but never had a chance to try it before. I was kind of a little bit worried actually, because when I was reading reviews or people's first impression of the yarn, uh, people had said that it's like not very soft. It's quite rustic, maybe sometimes a little itchy. Uh, so I was a bit hesitant, but they have such a great color range for Knit Picks palette. So yeah, I was a little bit hesitant to try it because 
I was worried it wouldn't be comfortable. I do have like a little bit of a sensitivity to um, wool. I can wear things that are quite rustic, but it also can tend to irritate me as well. I just I just put up with it because I like wearing wool. Um, so yeah, I was a little bit worried about the comfortability factor with this yarn. But I had tried Knit Picks Wool of the Andes, which is 100% Peruvian Highland wool, and it was very comfortable. I really liked it. So I wanted to try Palette. And uh, it's definitely not as soft as the other fingering weight wools they have, like thinking of Knit Pick Stroll, which is, I think, 75% um, superwash merino yarn, 25% nylon. Uh, so it's not as soft as that for sure, but it's still very comfortable to wear. Um, there is like, it does feel like wool, I guess you could say, like it does feel like a, your, I guess, traditional wool, but it's not prickly or itchy at all. It's just not soft, I guess you could say, like as soft as a merino wool. So I really like it. I definitely, we'll see how it, how it knits up. I haven't used it before. It looks like it's kind of like a two ply. So we'll see how that, that uh, works up. I don't know if you'll be able to tell. So far, really great first impressions. So enough about <laughs> the, the yarn, I'll go into the colors. Uh, so let's start off with um, the brighter color here. I wanted a bright electric blue because I'm thinking of knitting the Spot Sweater by Anne Wenzel. And I have like a pink, it's, it's kind of like a variegated pink, white, and yellow yarn. And I wanted something really bold for that. So I've decided for the contrast color, I'm going to do this electric blue. So I got three balls of Knit Picks palette and two balls of their aloft that I'm gonna hold for that pattern. The um, palette Celestial was on sale for $3.99 a ball. And then the aloft was on sale, it was half price. It was $4 for this ball. These prices are also in USD. I didn't have enough time before filming this podcast to convert it. <laughs> so maybe I'll put it down below or on the side here, the conversion to Canadian dollars, which is my currency uh, where I live. So yeah, I got enough of this to do the contrast color of that sweater. And the next uh, color that I got is tarragon. It was really inspired by uh, the chartreuse green in my Candyland wrap. I really liked working with it. So I wanted to get a sweater's quantity. So um, I first saw the Knit Picks Aloft shade, tarragon. And I was looking for um, a corresponding palette yarn that I could get. And so this was in the shade Tarragon and I was looking, I wanted something pretty vibrant, but I thought that maybe um, the Tarragon in the palette yarn would be the same. So I was like, you know what? I'll just get both in the shade Tarragon. Putting them up next to each other, the palette one is definitely darker. So not exactly what I was going for, but I still really like the color combination. I'm not gonna, I think for now the plan is to use them together because I don't wanna waste or I wouldn't waste the yarn, but I, I wanna use them together. So uh, the plan is to hold them together. It's just not as vibrant as I thought it was going to be, especially the palette. The Aloft is, is great, but I still think that they'll work together. I mean, there's the same shade name. So I feel like Knit Picks intended for them to be together. Um, but yeah, I usually like when the mohair is slightly darker than the the wool color that I hold with it, but I still think I'll do a gauge swatch and see how it knits up, but I really like it so far. And the palette tarragon was a pretty good sale, it was $2.99. And then the aloft was $6.99. And I got a sweater's quantity of both. Uh, then I got Knit Picks palette in the shade Finley Heather. Uh, I just thought I really like how uh, the Knit Picks does a lot of heathered wools because I just think it adds a lot of dimension uh, to a project. So I got this shade and I got an, enough to make a pretty substantial project. I got around 1400 meters and they were $2.99 each. I already have a corresponding mohair. It's also Knit Picks Aloft. It's, um, I'm forgetting the shade at the moment. I think it's called Plover. Uh, but I already had around 1400 meters of that yarn. So I just got this to pair with it. And I'm thinking I'm either gonna do uh, the Jenny Jacket V-neck or some sort of fingering weight sweater um, 
or cardigan. And then the last one is also a lot. Uh, it is the shade Koi. I already showed this in my winter knitting plans with stash yarn. Uh, so admittedly, it's new stash. <laughs> I got it as soon as I basically filmed that video, but it's still technically stash, so that's why I was in the video. Uh, and uh, if you watch that video, what I'm planning to make with this yarn is the Aura Top by Rose Knitwear. So I just got uh, two balls of the yarn. I think you need a little bit more than two balls, but I had knit the Oslo hat uh, in the past with this combination and Cascade Heritage. So I have some leftovers of that mohair, so hopefully together will be enough. And if not, I'll just make it a bit cropped. Uh, and this yarn was also on sale for half price. They were $4 each. So that was everything for podcast episode number four. I'm really trying to finish all of um, some of the whips, maybe not all of them, but <laughs> some of the whips. So hopefully in my next episode, I'll have some more to share. Uh, since I have acquired a decent amount of uh, yarn, I haven't added them to my yarn shelves yet. So I'm thinking that maybe I might share like a yarn reorganization or stash tour video. Let me know down below if that's something that you're interested in because I'm still not fully sure if I want to share like my entire stash or if that's a video that people would be interested in. So if it is, uh, let me know down below. And what's also upcoming is my favorite videos to watch, uh, everything that I made in 2023 or 2023 Knits Roundup. So that will be coming as well to my channel soon. So uh, look out for those videos and until my next one, I'll, I'll see you later.